Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to the department for um, hosting this and having me back. It's a great thrill to be back here, see so many um, good friends, so many professors, teachers and professors that I had here from the, my very first uh, semester uh, put up with me and helped me get through the, the process. It would take a remarkable, <clears throat> maybe superhuman, single protagonist to preside over the Clayle City death trip. After all, this is a sweeping 14 book series with over 1,400 fictional characters. The death trip, even from its first volume, turns out to be too big for a single protagonist. So Rolando gives us two, Jeu Malacara and Rafa Buenrostro. Even the most casual reader of the death trip cannot help but fix on the two curious names of the dual protagonists. The names, bad face, good face, might imply that they would be representations of competing visions, adversaries or opposites, but we soon realize that it's not so. We see they're complementary and often conjoined. Today I'll talk about how these two characters constitute a type of Giannis, the two-faced Roman god of beginnings. How they serve a Giannis function throughout the series, marking not only the beginning, but the transitions in looking forward and backward. And how they are bearers of a particularized essence that marks the death trip and puts Rolando in the camp of, the, of uh, universal ironists. One note here, I will avoid the trap of associating too much of Rolando's own remarkable life and biography with the deeds and attitudes of his protagonists. That facile association as alter ego or mouthpiece is too limiting. This is fiction, and we will let Heu and Rafa unhitch themselves from their creator and roam about in the narrative playground that we, the readers, prepare for them. And besides, I still have bruises from where Eduardo Bina hit me over a printed over the head with a printed copy of my dissertation when I tried to do that with Cervantes. Together, the life stories and adventures of Keu Malacara and Rafa Buenrosto are large enough to carry the series. They are present throughout the death trip, often occupying the same novelistic space. Even when one appears alone, we find the specter of the other is never far away. Genealogically, they are cousins, but in practical terms, they grow up as brothers and become even closer. Folks remark that you don't see one without the other, like uh, Alicia Zavala and uh, Melissa Marti uh, Maureen a few years ago. You, you thought they were joined at the hip. Their characters become so conflated that the reader could be forgiven for getting them mixed up. They do some of the similar odd jobs around the valley when they are young, and they both join the army and serve in the Korean War. Later, they're college roommates at UT. Rolando tells us they're both major in Spanish, work at the library, and make extra money writing papers for the Alpha Phi's and the Thetas. They both return to the valley and rise to prominent professional positions. Most remarkable about their similarity and interchangeability, though, is their dialogue as they accompany each other and us throughout the trip. We see the use of this private language in the epistolary novel Mi Querido Rafa, even in the English language recreation of the book, they code switch between English, Spanish, and German, and redneck, including phrases like, thank you kindly. <laughs> when Heu parodies the Clale City banker Naughty Perkins in a booming all caps, he writes, and all that money, son. And we can hear exactly how that sounds. We can imagine them finishing each other's sentences in an intimacy of language that only lifelong companions can share. So they, like Janos, sometimes seem to be two, he two heads fused to the same body. Janos, the god of beginnings, the source of our name for January, was ritually invoked at the beginning of each year of the Roman calendar. Our dual protagonists appear at the beginning of the death trip with the Stampus del Valle, the first book of the series that won Rolando the Quinto Soul Prize in 1973. Rolando starts the book before he knew it would be a death trip, encompassing a vast fictional space as rich and compelling as Macondo or Yoctopanafa County, with a wink to the chivalric romance tradition of emphasizing the, emphasizing the lineage of epic heroes. We see Roque Malacara, Jesus' father, courteously asking for the hand of Teresa in the working class living room of his future suegro, Teu Vilches. This beginning presages the character of the entire series in that it constitutes a melding of the noble and the plain in the most humble circumstances. More about this hybridity later, we'll talk about Heu and Rafa as carriers 
a particularized essence. In Jehu Malakata's youth, he is surrounded by death. His three infant sisters die. His mother dies when he is six years old, and he is orphaned at age nine by the death of his father. We first see Rafa Buenrosto as a small child in Estampas de Valle, where he, deathly ill with a fever, is miraculously healed by the efforts of La Tia Panchita in a scene that I dare you to read without smiling. Before the Death Trip's first home is half done, we see them together as adolescents, where the Tia Mati Buenrostro is raising them both as if they were her sons. They are inseparable and never stray far from the line of the story throughout. Fate then pushes Jeu Malacara and Rafa Buenrostro together. They are survivors, death cheaters, tricksters, even demigods, and they are our escorts throughout the rest of the Death Trip. In Roman religion and myth, Janos is also the god of transitions, gates, doors, and passages. As Janos frequently symbolizes the movement of time from past to future, Heu and Rafa grow through the 1940s and the valley changes with them. The sons of old Mexican revolutionaries go off to fight for the United States in World War II, and when they come back, they and their families gradually start to restake their claim in what their blood has made again their country. Heu and Rafa do odd jobs around Belcott County as boys. Heu is a mechanics helper and later an assistant to an itinerant preacher. They both go to high school in Clail and establish a coldly cordial peace with the Bolillada, the Anglos who still held largely uncontested power in Belkin County. When Heu and Rafa are of age, they join the army and see service in the Korean War. We, mo we know much less of Heu's service as a chaplain's assistant than we do of Rafa's experience as an artilleryman. But we see that Rafa's harrowing experience in Korea is pregnant with the battlefield deaths of boyhood friends from the valley, of fellow soldiers, and of senior officers and NCOs whose mental wounds fatally overtake them in bunkers and barracks. When Rafa returns from the war and has the opportunity to take advantage of the GI Bill, he resolves not to joderse. I don't know what joderse means. It must be a reflexive verb. Maybe it means to fail to take advantage of your economic or Educa educational opportunities in this case. And Rafa resolves not to miss out on his, his educational opportunities. Um, opportunities earned by his service and the blood of his friends. Their academic credentials and their own intrepid spirits allow our protagonists to reach positions of respect and authority when they return to the valley. By the time we read Ask a Policeman, Keu is the vice president of the Clail City Bank and Rafa is the chief inspector of the Belkin County Homicide Division. And the valley is nothing like it's depicted in the Estampas del Valle. Their story and their growth into adulthood and maturity parallel the story of the valley's change. The two faces of Giannis represented the ability to see into the future with one face and into the past with another. And similarly, our protagonists forge ahead in the death trip while being completely conscious of their past. The death trip is replete with references to the viejos mexicanos, the revolucionarios like Don Braulio Tapia, Don Manuel Guzman, and Jesus El Quieto Buenrostro, people who, like uh, Rolando himself, descended from families who settled in Texas when it was still an extension of Nueva España. They didn't cross any border. The border crossed them, and the lands and legal status that were taken from them in the Texas Ranger enabled land and power grabs that followed the establishment of Texas as a republic and later as a state generated in the Mexicanos Tejanos what Erlinda Gonzalez Berry coined as the poetics of Aguante. The backwards look in the death trip cannot help but catalog many of the injustices of the Anglo-controlled valley. No one more starkly than the episode where Don Aureliano Mora, after waiting three years for justice for the killing of his son, sees the deputy who killed him get off scot-free. Don Aureliano's response is to smash to bits the war memorial plaque at the park in Cleo with a crowbar and to later turn himself in to the constable, Don Manuel Guzman. Don Aureliano eventually lives long enough to see Deputy Van Mears dead by natural causes and buried. A poor substitute for justice, but a great example of aguante. Rolando's treatment of injustice in the valley is not done with a strident and impatience or from a strongly political stance. He gets at the themes of racist, uh, racism and inequality in a more subtle and nuanced way. For example, Rolando's identification of the good guys and bad guys is not easily divided along racial lines. Several raza, 
Ira Escobar, the political stooge of the Valley's moneyed interests, Los Leguizamán, Los que fueron hijos de tía porque nunca tuvieron madre, <laughs> as well as Bob Peñalosa, the rowboat Anglo, are identified as turncoats and traidores. Rolando approaches injustice as a universal ironist. An explanation of what I mean by universal ironist is in order. It's not my term. I'm borrowing it. In Lowry Nelson's introduction to his collection of critical essays on Cervantes, he writes, quote, as depictors of the human condition, both Shakespeare and Cervantes belong to the select company of those I would call universal ironists, distinct from tendentious ironists. Universal ironists contemplate the world with a kind of gentle resignation and compassion in full knowledge of both the grandeurs and the miseries of human life. Among them I would number Chaucer, Chekhov, Kafka, and Italo Suevo. Tendentious ironists view the world from a programmatic stance connotating or connoting accusation, bitter protest, and meliorist reformation of human ills. Among them I would include Flaubert, Ibsen, Hardy, and Mann. The distinction is only approximate but nonetheless significant. Neither attitude is qualitatively superior or justifiable, but it is perhaps the universal ironist who can view mankind with greater tolerance and understanding. It is he who can encompass a broader span of human types and human experiences. It is he who can best present the inviolability and unique essence of the particular and the individual. It is precisely this ability in Shakespeare and Cervantes to create particularized essence that leads us, their readers, to draw the general conclusion to see the individual as representative, hence the seeming plenitude we see, plenitude of humanity we see, in such odd and peculiar figures as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, not to mention Sanson Carrasco, Marcela, Ginés de Pasamonte, and others." Unquote. And I include Rolando in this group with Cervantes and Shakespeare as a universal ironist. Readers of the Death Trip would include in that plenitude of humanity Geun Rafa, as well as Pei Galindo, Becky Escobar, Bruno Cano, Viola Barragan, Pio Quinto Reyes, Dirty Barón, and even Naughty Perkins. They seem to be common average men and women drawn at random from what has been cast as a generalized homogenous population, but they are each incredibly unique. We first see this particularized essence, the fusing of the common and the remarkable in the gritty realism of the New Testament, where a distinctly different deity, finally, God with us, walks the dusty roads from Nazareth to Jerusalem, is tempted, experiences anger, hunger and fatigue, and washes the feet of his disciples. That kind of combination of the quotidian, the remarkable, is seen in the Quixote, where the knight and squire, in their attempt to recreate epic feats of chivalric romance, throw up on each other, and defecate within an arm's reach of each other, and scrounge scraps of bread and onion from Sancho's saddlebags. We see every one of their foolish misadventures and their self-deception, and yet we admire Sancho's ingenuity, and Don Quixote's impossibly high-minded ideals, and we love them, if we're romantic readers of the Quixote. And I know not everybody, not everybody is. Rolando emphasizes this realism in his preliminary note to Estampas del Valle, where he describes the social machinery of the valley as, quote, embadurnadas con grasa humana, unquote. He is even more explicit in his introduction to the book Cleo City, where he writes, quote, aquí no hay héroes de leyenda. Esta gente va al excusado, estornuda, se limpia los mocos, cría familias, conoce lo que es morir con el ojo pelón, se cortea con dificultad y como madera verde resiste rajarse. La gente sospecha que vivir es algo heroico en sí. So Rafa and Jeu constitute for elemental representations of the heroic in their struggle to make their way through life. Jeu and Rafa are remarkable as individuals who follow their own compass while representing an entire population of raza in the valley, whose courage, sense of justice, and aguante ennoble them and endear them to us. They point out for us the holy in the humble, the poetic in the prosaic. They fulfill for us the office of the Janus that marks the beginning, key phases, and end of the Cleo City death trip, and they carry the spark of the divine embedded in the flesh of their humanity. They are fictional to be sure, but real enough to inspire us to take the trip with them. 
Thank you, Rolando, for the gift of the trip. And thank you for taking us with you.